So good morning, everyone. My name is Anna Hamlin. I'm a morning meteorologist at News Center One. And although I was not around for the, the flood, we've been doing a lot of stories and just trying to collect a lot of weather stories as well as community stories. So this morning, I am here uh, with Susan Sanders with the National Weather Service. She's our morning coordinations meteorologist. And then I also have Bob. Um, he began, <laughs> Bob Riggio, <laughs> just Bob. <laughs> it's funny because Bob has been like my mentor so many years. He's just, he's just Bob. <laughs> Bob Riggio, um, he's our chief meteorologist emeritus at New Center One, and he clearly has a lot of weather knowledge of this area. He wrote a book of half a century on the job, I believe it was, as a meteorologist, which is a huge collection of knowledge. Also, Alexa White, she is with Rapid City Pennington County Emergency Management, um, and what is it a chief deputy? Deputy Director, that's what it is, um, with Pennington County Rapid City Emergency Management. And also Melissa Smith, she's a hydrologist with the National Weather Service as well. So we have a lot to go through presentations wise, so much knowledge in this room meteorologically. So it's gonna kick us off, is it Bob? Bob, Bob Riggio, Bob. take it away. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, let me just start off by, by saying I, I was here on, uh, 50 years ago on this day. So I was in Rapid City. And for me, speaking personally, the weather conditions that developed on that day, I've never seen them happen uh, during my career. And over 50 years, I've been involved with, in meteorology in some way or another. And I, 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 I think I can say the, those weather conditions probably never occurred prior to June 9th, 1972, certainly have not occurred after June 9th. So they're, it's very historic what, what occurred as far as the weather is concerned. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the uh, ingredients to making it rain. And it's real simple. There's three ingredients you need. If you don't have one, it's not going to rain. Moisture. Moisture is one of those ingredients. And believe me, June 9th, 1972, we had a, a, an abundance, abundance of moisture. I'm going to show you that in a little bit. You need, a little, you need instability and you need a trigger. You need trigger something to kick the whole thing off. Let's talk moisture. And when I talk moisture, I'm just going to talk dew point. This is the, uh, the Raywind sign on that morning, June 9th, 1972. This is the way it looked. And this green line right here, this is dew point. And dew point simply is a, a measure of moisture. This red line is your temperature. The x-axis basically is temperature going from left to right, increasing temperature. And the y-axis is height. So this is the National Weather Service launches these balloons twice a day, 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. And it measures moisture in the atmosphere, a profile of moisture. It measures temperature in the atmosphere. It measures wind speed and direction. And it also measures pressure. So those three things. So basically, on the morning of uh, June 9th, 6 a.m., this is the dew point. The further the, the uh, dew point is from the uh, temperature line, the drier the atmosphere. So what does this tell you? It was the, the morning Raywind sign indicated very dry conditions here at Rapid City. Very dry conditions. Not so to the east. This is Huron. Same time, 6 a.m. in the morning, June 9th. And look how close the dew point is to the uh, temperature. Huron, after uh, post-analysis of that sounding, that was historic amount of precipitable water. Huron's never seen that much precipitable water in the atmosphere. Record amount of moisture in the atmosphere. That was uh, uh, upstream from Rapid City because on that morning, the low level jet, 10,000 feet and below, was coming from the east to southeast. It's coming uh, from Huron into the, into the Black Hills area. So that moisture you're looking at right there was heading toward uh, uh, Rapid City and the Black Hills. This is the 6 p.m. Rapid City upper air sounding. Look how close that dew point is now to the temperature. Historic uh, amount of moisture in the atmosphere, all the way up to 300 millibars, which is 
30, 35,000 feet, something like that. The atmosphere was saturated, saturated with moisture. So we had a, uh, an abundance of moisture on that day, and it was being invected in uh, from the east as well as the southeast. Uh, th this is the, uh, the, the surface winds, 6 a.m., 17 miles an hour, uh, noontime, 33 miles an hour, 6 p.m., 52 mile per hour winds. And we were involved in, in a research program called Cloud Catcher, and we were launching pie balls, which measures the low-level jet. And one of those pie balls measured winds out of the uh, southeast at 76 miles per hour. Low-level jet was just incredible on that day, just pumping in all of this moisture coming in from the east and southeast. And what's unusual, after the sun went down, you typically the low-level jet would decrease would weaken a little bit. It did not on June 9th, 1972. So after the sun went down, we still had some strong winds in the low levels bringing in that moisture. Look at the dew points, 72 uh, degrees, 72 degrees dew points all across, South, all across South Dakota, right through there. Again, historic. And if we look at this next slide, those dew points, this is a, a, a timeline on June 9th from 1 a.m. all the way to 1 a.m. Uh, June 10th. There's the dew point. It just stayed at 70 degrees. Incredible amount of moisture. Once again, incredible. I can't repeat that enough. Uh, when we have dew points in the upper 50s, lower 60s, you can expect severe weather. You can expect some flood warning, some, uh, some flood watches being issued. In the upper 50s and 60s, we had dew points in the lower 70s on that day. And this, is, and this is the situation. We had this moisture coming in, but with the low-level jet, uh, just feeding that cloud that developed during the late afternoon and evening hours. Instability, what about instability? We need instability to have rain showers, and we certainly had instability. That's cold air over warm air. That's the boiling effect. This was uh, 6 a.m., again, using those upper-level soundings. This trough right here, this is a pocket of cold air and at 6 p.m., there it is. It, it moved from the, uh, the uh, southwest right over the Black Hills area. So we have this pocket of cold air over the top of us, warm air, warm moist air below. Situation is beginning to develop where we're going to have some strong thunderstorms throughout the day. We need a trigger, something to kick the thing off, to get, the, to get everything in motion. And the trigger on that day was, well, it was really two triggers. Number one, we had a, a stationary front. This was a 6, a 6 p.m. A surface analysis, 6 p.m. on June the 9th. And you can see this uh, surface uh, stationary front uh, stretched right across South Dakota. And that's the trigger. The, the, the other trigger, of course, is the Black Hills, or graphic lifting. I mean, we have these winds coming in from the east to southeast. They're hitting the Black Hills. They're being lifted. So all three ingredients were in place at the time. But we, we always get that. I mean, we always get rain showers, but nothing of the intensity uh, as what we had on June 9th, 1972. So what else happened on that day? And the important thing that happened, uh, well, here we go. I should have gone through these slides, but we got just a, a generally northeasterly wind uh, to the north of this stationary front, and a little bit of a southerly wind to the south. So you're getting a little bit of a convergence line right through here. So that, that, again, that's the uh, trigger. And 9 p.m., there it is, stationary. It hasn't gone anywhere. And again, midnight, June 9th, again, that stationary front remains in place. So the trigger remained in place. So on that day, towering cu uh, cumulus began to develop over the hills through orographic lifting because of the Black Hills. Thunderstorms developed over northeastern uh, Wyoming. At 3 p.m., a line of thunderstorms developed over southeast of Rapid City and moved northwest. Big deal. That happens all the time in June. We see that all the time. What else happened on that day to cause 15 inches of rain in six hours? That's the, that's the question. This right here, this upper-level high pressure, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But uh, the key were the steering winds. Typically, when we get 
thunderstorms developing over the Black Hills, we get these winds aloft, strong winds aloft that push them off the Black Hills, that push them off into the plains. If we had some of those strong steering winds aloft, then those, uh, those, those uh, heavy uh, thunderstorms that developed on that day would have been slid off the uh, Black Hills off into the prairies. These are the steering winds right here. Generally, out of the, out of the west at around five to 10 miles an hour. So the steering, the steering winds were extremely light. We could not push the, those uh, thunderstorms off the Black Hills. They remained stationary. So they developed in the afternoon. They didn't go anywhere. And of course, the Black Hills remained stationary. They're not going anywhere. So we had this orographic lifting. We had uh, very light winds to push, to push these uh, thunderstorms off the Black Hills. So they remained stationary. And we have this tremendous amount of moisture uh, moving in at the low levels, just feeding, feeding those uh, storms. And again, there's the Black Hills. Uh, and that, that's basically, we've got some rainfall totals for you, which is historic. Once again, look at the uh, Nemo Ranger Station right here. 14 inches of rain from that particular storm. We all know that. They, in, in a short period of time, within six hours, we saw 15 inches of rain. Johnson siding, eight inches of rain, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. in a short period of time. Two, six, uh, that's 14 inches of rain, 14 inches of rain in a three hour period. Uh, Schroeder Road, they had, well, you can add those, uh, those numbers up. Tremendous amount of moisture, tremendous amount of moisture here at Sheridan Lake, all upstream from, uh, from uh, Canyon Lake. And these are the uh, rainfall amounts. And what's incredible is just the, the short period of time, like for example, just shortly after around 7 p.m., 8 p.m., lo look how much rain fell in that just that short period of time, nearly 13 inches of rain uh, just, west of, uh, just west of Rapid City. Over here, uh, just uh, five miles south, southwest of Sturgis, over 11 inches, and here at 6 p.m. Pactola over seven inches in just an incredible short period of time. So those are the three, the four situations that occurred. We had an abundance amount of moisture, definitely some strong instability. We had a trigger, the Black Hills, plus this uh, stationary front, and we had light winds aloft, the little steering winds that pushed those, that were, were not able to push those thunderstorms off the Black Hills. And it rained uh, from 3 p.m through shortly after midnight that evening in one location. I, th I think that's, that's the, the, the weather situation on that day. Melissa, she's gonna talk about the hydrology. Okay, I'm not sure where the what do I, there's a button, oh, there we go. Okay, so as Bob was saying, there around 1.30, we were starting to see the, um, the storms develop over northeastern Wyoming. We had a little cell there just to the southwest of, of Sturgis. By about, oh, three o'clock or so, there were some rain gauges that the Forest Service operated. And that's when we first started getting a little bit of the rainfall. You know, it, it was just, it was just kind of starting to rain. We got to four o'clock. It started raining a little bit more. We had around two inches around the Galena area to the southwest of Sturgis. And there was about an inch of rain that fell over Northwest Rapid City. Five o'clock, the heaviest rain was still up in along Bear Butte Creek. In that area, we had about four inches southwest of Sturgis that fell in about two hours. None of those rainfall reports were being relayed in real time. So these were amounts that we found afterwards. Also, the rain began around Pactola around five o'clock. Four inches of rain that fell up there in that Galena area. By six o'clock, the storms really started to fill in along the eastern slopes of the Black Hills. The area in blue there shows about the extent of the rainfall. There was a foot of water coming down Bear Butte Creek in Boulder Canyon between Sturgis and Deadwood. We were starting to get some heavy rains 
around the Pactola area and downstream of Pactola. And then the rainfall also started to extend down to just west of the Hermosa area. By seven o'clock, the radar operator at the school of mines notified the weather service that they were getting rainfall rates about two inches an hour. At that time, the weather service issued a flash flood warning, but the flash flood warning was for areas around the Sturgis area, that Boulder Canyon area, Bear Butte Creek, Elk Creek, those areas that were also receiving the significant, the significant rainfall. There was also some reporting along Box Elder Creek. There was dams broken around the Nemo area. That was a closer to 745. So we look ahead to eight o'clock. Eight o'clock, the storms, they were a pretty solid line of storms. They really didn't move. They started filling in more to the south. We issued a flash flood warning for Box Elder and Rapid Creek basins after eight o'clock and the Ellsworth Air Force Base radar operator started telling us about the heavy rainfall rates that they were seeing on the radar at that time. Nine o'clock, still raining heavily. The storms hadn't moved. They were still over the area. They were just beginning to, to shift southward at this time. But the rainfall amounts, the heavy rainfall that they were seeing over the Elk Creek Basin, the Bear Butte Basin started moving southward, closer to um, Box Elder Creek, Rapid Creek, Spring Creek, those areas. Nine and a half inches of rain by nine o'clock was reported in Nemo with 11.3 inches at Sheridan Lake. Also, between 9.15 and 10.15, the river gauge on, on Rapid Creek near Canyon Lake rose 12 feet in an hour. There was also a rise of three and a half feet on Rapid Creek in just 15 minutes above Canyon Lake. All that water coming down, you had water coming through Dark Canyon or Rapid Creek, water coming out of Claycorn Canyon, Red Rock Canyon, all that water was coming down and filling um, Canyon Lake. Around 10 o'clock, the spillway on Canyon Lake became clogged with debris, the trees, the homes, everything that was flowing down, and the actual dam became overtopped around 10 o'clock. By 10.45, Canyon Lake Dam failed. 11 o'clock, it just started raining at the Rapid City Airport. Before this, all the rain was west of Rapid City and in Rapid City on the western side of town. Anyone on the eastern side of town didn't even receive rain until closer to 11 o'clock at night. By this time, Rapid Creek peaked above the Canyon Lake gauge. You had the flows coming down Claycorn Canyon that peaked at the same time. With all the, the flows peaking, the storm was moving downstream, dumping additional heavy rainfall, contributing to the flows on Rapid Creek. And then by midnight, the flood crest reached downtown Rapid City with an estimated 50,000 cubic feet per second flow. And then by five o'clock in the morning, Rapid Creek was back in its banks in just that short amount of time. Here's the overall rainfall totals that we saw. And there was upwards of 14 inches that were reported in the Box Elder Creek Basin, the Rapid Creek Basin, and then even in the Spring Creek Basin. So those are the rainfall totals. And you can see how they were just stationed just from about the Sturgis area all the way down to about west of Hermosa was the most significant amounts. Turn it over to Susan Sanders. So just as, as technology has changed our lives individually and day-to-day -day activities, so has technology changed the way we observe weather, we measure weather, and, uh, and we warn people. So I'm gonna go through some of the changes that uh, happened since that time. This was a picture of the Ellsworth Air Force Base weather radar uh, at 7.30 at night, and you can see some pretty fuzzy echoes. So uh, the center here is at the base, and I'm not sure how, how big the range rings were, but uh, they were probably 10 to 20 miles an hour, uh, miles apart to give a, an idea of the distance. So first of all, we see it's not a lot of detail and not a lot of information available from that. 
Today's radar, the Doppler radar that we use, has a lot more detail. So first of all, this is the storm intensity. This is what you normally see on the TV news. This is what you, if you have a radar app, this is what you would see. So this is an example from the Hermosa flash flood. It's kind of a similar situation, but on a very much smaller scale than in 1972, where a storm pretty much sat just west of Hermosa. But unfortunately, so just like all that rain that fell in Deer Creek, Prairie Creek, Victoria Creek, Rapid Creek, and all those converged it, before it came into Rapid City, which was a contributing factor to the, the high volume of water through town. We have Battle Creek and Grace Coolidge Creeks that converge just upstream of Hermosa. So all that water fell in the basin and flooded Hermosa, which is in that circle there. So we saw where the thunderstorm was and how, whether it was moving or not. So two features at the, of the Doppler radar that wasn't really available back in 1972. And the Doppler radar also makes rainfall estimates. While it may not be perfect, at least it gives our forecasters the ability to then interrogate where they're seeing the heaviest rain and, and get ground truth, which I'll show in the next slide, but also it tells us we have the overlay of the streams so that we can see what streams are affected and it makes our flash flood warnings much more uh, informational to people so that people know which streams are flooding and whether or not they're affected by those floodwaters. So again, here's Hermosa, here's Battle Creek and Grace Coolidge Creek that come together just on the west side of 79 and all those floodwaters just race through the south side of town. So what, what was a great tool for this? One of the stream gauges nowadays, like Melissa said, back in 1972, they were recording rainfall, but that information wasn't available until somebody retrieved that information a much later time. Now this data is being transmitted by satellite in real time, and we get the reports of the stream levels every 15 minutes if it's raining considerably if the streams are going up. And so we can see how fast the water is going up as well as how much rain is falling at that location. So our forecasters get a lot more information about what is happening in the atmosphere and what's happening on the ground. That enables us to get much better uh, flash flood warnings out to people. The second part of the warning improvement process is communicating that information to people in danger. In 1972, the Weather Service just had a one-way phone line from the office at the airport to the media in town. And so they would pick up the phone, which would make a tone or light flash in the studios. And the reporters would copy this information down when the weather service person read it to them. And then they would put on that information on a scroll. That was it. And there was no other way to get warning information. And as you probably realize, a great deal of town had power out by the time that we issued that flash flood warning for Rapid City at 8.15. Today, we have NOAA Weather Radio. That's a small weather uh, radio receiver that you can have in your home, uh, portable ones that you can carry with you, but you can set it so that it let goes off when we issue a warning. It'll wake you up in the middle of the night. They have batteries, so they work if the power is out. We also, the local media monitors that signal as well. So just when you get those warnings on your weather radio receiver, the scroll comes over the TV station or interrupts programming on radio stations. And our warnings are also sent over cell phones. So you'll get that little bit different tone and that's one of the wireless emergency alerts that our warnings are fed automatically to the cell phones 
and you'll get those and and you will get those only if it's you're in pretty close proximity to that warning so unlike some warning systems where it blankets the entire county you know so something going on by hill city isn't going to affect people in wall even though we're in the same county this is pretty specific so that when you get one of those you are in danger of that storm or flood and now alexa is going to talk about preparedness and uh, the warning uh, information. All right, so one thing she talked about is, you know, we had ways to reach people, which was pretty singular. It was TV and maybe radio. Um, we did have sirens at that time, but there was no record of them going off. Nobody reported that they were heard, so obviously I wasn't born then. <laughs> I was born in 1973, close. Um, but so we have a lot more technology now. And um, one of these things that specifically is with water is our MetWarn system. And this is, you know, 13 gauges and measure precipitation and um, the amount of the water rising so that we can have some of that warning before the water reaches us. And that's very helpful. There was a website up top that you can go and it shows all of the MetWarn stations that are throughout South Dakota. And you can actually set up to get warnings. So if you live in an area that is, you know, near a creek, beautiful most of the time, but when those rainstorms come, you want to know, you want to have some warning, you can get a notification sent to your farm. I want to know when it reaches right before flood stage or right. You can choose that amount. So that's a real great capability. And that can be a text message or an email, however you want to get that set up. Um, but that system was put into place in October of 1998. And you can see our funding partners are USGS, the city of Rapid City, Pennington County, Hill City, Keystone, and Rapid Valley Water. All of those have a great stake in making sure that system gives them the information that they need to make decisions ahead of time. And this is a map just shows where those gauges are. I know it's hard to see here on the screen, but um, if you go to that website, you can see all of these. I do have a couple of these maps if somebody wanted to take one with them today. Um, but it shows which ones measure precipitation and which ones have, um, you know, what, what they do, what that gauge specifically does at that time. Another thing I wanted to talk about is what we had for responders at that time. So we know that we had responders, but how did they get their information? Well, at that time, there wasn't a 911 answering point. We have that now. We have people who get that information quickly. So when one of you calls in and says, hey, this is going on, immediately there is somebody, in almost every case, there's somebody who can go out. Now, we don't have excess people, but we have enough. Now, when you have an event like this, it, when is enough? Enough? You know, that's the part that we don't know what we'll need when we have it. But you can see what we didn't have then was search and rescue, but now we do. And what this team does and what they have now, they have 34 volunteer team members and they love this stuff. They do it for free. They want to help people. They want to find people in the woods. They want to cut people out of cars. So this is a great resource that we have now that we didn't have then. Uh, Rapid City Fire Department said 71 personnel back in 1972. Now we have 142 total personnel, you know, and we are the regional hazmat team here in our area, which is awesome. We also uh, have just paramedics and we do the EMS portion. So we have, you know, paramedics or EMTs, all of those are EMTs. So um, just a great resource that we have for our area specifically and for the surrounding communities around us that may need assistance. Uh, Pennington County Fire, now the number of volunteers hasn't really changed much, 500 back then to 510 now, um, but the amount of training that those 510 have is significantly increased. My husband's a chief at North Haines, and sometimes I'm like, are you ever home? Got training. Uh, but, but they keep busy, and, and it's important to them, and they love to go out in the middle of the night. He went out a couple days ago for a fire in the middle of the night and he's tired for a few days but then he catches up you know but they they want to help people and they have EMS trained people sometimes they have paramedics who do that for their day job and they they are also on the department that that help out so they have some of that um, that goes through of note I just wanted to say this is Keystone Fire Department and this is they had a significant amount of damage in the 1972 flood um, and about a year and a half ago, we had the gala from Keystone come down and she said, 
I was looking through the archives and I found that on June 8th, 1972 is when Keystone became a town, which probably helped them in the recovery greatly. Whereas if they would have been unincorporated, you know, that would have been a lot longer haul for them. So this was an amazing thing that happened the day before this big flood, so. Rapid City Police Department, 64 at that time, 130 now. You know, pretty big change, and you think, oh, why do they need another person, you know? But you can see we really, in 50 years, ha have done a lot, but our growth is, is a lot more now, too. So you can see why we need more officers. And I just put this picture, this is the car that the police department has right now. Um, and I called Brendan Medina over the, at the police department to ask, I said, by chance, was this the type of car that we had in 1972? And he said, well, probably, he, he called and, and talked to some of the folks at the department, this is what was being used in the United States, probably more in California, um, this particular car. Um, but most likely they had Ford Galaxies at that time, so with, but a very similar look as to what this is right now. So um, gives you that you know, idea of what they might have had at that time. Um, the Sheriff's Office, so 10, 10 responding personnel for a very large county. You can see how they wouldn't get very far very fast, especially in a situation like this. Now they have 100 full-time deputies. So they keep pretty busy in, in our, our towns and our you know, Hill City, Keystone Wall, they have their own deputies, one or two that's for their area. And so uh, that is a huge improvement from where we were back in 1972. Um, and, and of course we know the parks, um, these beautiful parks that we get to look at and we don't wanna forget why they're there, how they're there, and remember why they're there. That's what we wanna do. And um, just all of the lives that were lost and the beauty that remains there, that, that's part of the reason why we have those, and that it was renamed um, in 2009 to the Leonard Swanson Memorial. And as I mentioned, this was a, a quote that I found. Um, it's there because people died. It was purchased at the most precious price. We need to protect that legacy. So 50 years later, jurisdictions along the creek, we have to remember, don't let people sleep in the floodplain. And it's hard to see land unused when we could be putting something there, right? I'm looking at Richie, you guys, you know, get, get approached for, for let's do this here, let's do that there. Well, okay, maybe we can do this daytime thing, but let's not let people sleep in these areas that we know the water will come. Whether or not it'll be a 1972 amount of water, let's not, let's not try that again. So what you can do, so talking about the technology, um, I know one of the biggest things, uh, Susan touched on it with the wireless emergency alerts, most of us have cell phone. I would probably say, I don't even know what the percentage is, probably 85% of people now, even 90 maybe, have a cell phone. Maybe they don't even know how to use all of its functions, <laughs> but we get, we get those warnings and those life-threatening, this might kill you kind of warnings, and that's what you want to get. But is that enough? Sometimes what we have found is that people need to hear it more than once. They need to hear it from their friends. They need to hear it, maybe if the siren goes off, they need to see it on their phone and they go, whoa, this is like real. This, is, this could be bad. I need to find out what's going on. I need to seek out official information from trusted sources and see if I need to go upstream, get up a hill, go down in my basement, depending on what's going on. Um, we also have... Um, Public warning messages, which is what we have uh, a pro, uh, company called Everbridge that we use for this. So it's the same kind of thing as a wireless emergency alert, but that's very specific what you can send out on a wireless emergency alert and has to meet certain criteria. But there are other things that we might want to know about that have the potential to kill you that we can't quite get to that wireless emergency alert level. And so this is something that you could sign up for. That information's on our website. Just look for this exclamation and you can find that. Um, and of course, having that emergency kit. Um, you hear this kind of thing all the time, 72 hours, you wanna be prepared. Cause what if you didn't have clean water for three days, four days, five days, what would you do? You wanna have enough for three days for your entire family, change of clothes. We do have these on a magnet at our booth, down at our table, so if you wanted to pick up one of these, all of that's on there as well. So I mentioned the public warning messages. Um, 
she, uh, Susan mentioned the weather radios, wireless emergency alert, all of these, these all work together to give people an idea that something is going on. So whether you're watching TV and you think, oh, what's that weird noise? Or, oh, my phone just went off. Oh, do I hear sirens? That is the trigger. So one type of warning doesn't work to reach all of you the same way. So we want to have multiple layers of warning and you want to have things that wake you up in the middle of the night, like the wireless uh, emergency alert potentially or your uh, weather radio. And up in the hills where you maybe don't have cell phone service, what do you do then? You want to make sure you have that weather radio because it's going to work and give you what you need. And Susan, you could tell me, you can specify what you want warnings on. Just want to look at you to make sure I'm saying that correctly. You, and the area, um, the specific area encoding. So you want to get one with same technology, S-A-M-E. And you can say, I want to know about thunderstorms. I want to know about tornadoes. I don't want to know maybe about, there's a, there's a watch, so that don't wake me up for that. <laughs> but you can choose what you want to know about. So again, all of these work together to give you information and alert that something is happening. And I just wanted to touch on, you know, our office, we have some different programs for people that want to go an extra step. We have the Community Emergency Response Team training. Now, this is um, not something where you're going to get paged out to go to an event or to an incident, but what it's going to do is give you skills to know what to do. If you are somewhere, you see an accident happen in front of you, there's a big event that happens at your in your, and you're at home and you need to keep your family safe, you're gonna have some skills and training with medical, with light search and rescue, um, fire extinguisher training, a lot of different things that are gonna help you make choices and not feel like, I don't know what to do. You're gonna be like, hey, I remember, I learned this. So it's a seven week course, it's free. You get a backpack and a really cool hat that you get to wear. You can see him wearing this in the picture <laughs> there. Um, and again, we keep that free. We have some sponsors that help us um, with the backpack costs. So. And we also have uh, Stop the Bleed training. That's just an hour and a half um, training that you can take to learn how to use a tourniquet and to help somebody who might be having serious bleeding. So you can find some of those on our website as well. And preparedness is a shared responsibility. It takes all of us. It takes all of our partners talking about what we know and what we've learned and what we can do better each and every day. So that's all I've got, and I'll give this back to you. Perfect. Well, thank you guys so much. I think it's about time to rotate to the next session, is that right? <laughs> yeah, does anyone have one question for any of our panelists? Your hand was up first, so I'll go for you. <laughs> yep. Well, we do have the water rescue team now that we didn't have then, and they do training. They train in ice. They train in swift water rescue. They train, you know, using boats, um, all, all of those things, and that's within the Rapid City Fire Department kind of heads up that program, but the people that make up that team are you know, from all of our departments, from our couple from the sheriff's office, couple from, you know, fire department, the police department, and they continue that, that training. So they're trained for, for use of ropes? Yes, yes. All, all of those aspects. So, so if they were trying to rescue a person from, from Swiftwater who, who is alive and holding on to something, then they get on the other side or they get out and they tie a boat you know, and, and you can actually watch their trainings. They, they usually put out that we're going to be training. If you ever wanted to go see them do that, um, just watch the Rapid City Fire Department's um, page for that information. And for anybody who has additional questions, uh, both emergency management and the weather service ha have tables downstairs. So we'll be around, especially this afternoon, and you can ask your question if you didn't have time. Thank you guys so much, all of your wisdom and experience. Thank you guys for coming too.
listed as a low side. Okay. And since so you have to interview them. Well, it's, I it's also listed for you to write, so I figured I'd ask you. Because I didn't want to just pick somebody and say good luck. Okay. Can I interview you for like one minute? I'll go grab the tripod. Sure. Sure. Um, Brendan, did you